It's that time. Game of the year. Hello and welcome to Triangle Square Edo PlayStation Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Beck, and alongside me, as always, is... Mr. Saul Bridges, bringing you guys 146. He's... 146? Did you just jump so many episodes? Aren't we? Wasn't it 143 last week? 144. I felt like I made the thumbnail for 144 already, but I'm this this whole, like, three or four days has been a fever dream. Saul's been sick, so yeah, he's experienced episodes that haven't even happened. He actually saw the future. Mm. Huh. I'm trying to think of something clever there, but my brain eludes it. Well, your name is Saul. You just be dumb and say, who Saul? Not worth it. <laughs> Next episode will be SOL. <laughs> there won't be an episode 145. Uh, Audio will get screwed. No, don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't, don't you put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby. Uh, anyway, if you have never heard of us, uh, it's a weird time for you to be jumping into the train. Uh, but we are Triangle Square to PlayStation Podcast. We talk about PlayStation and, of course, their competition, things that we'd like to see PlayStation do that we see the competition excelling in, or things that we'd like to see the competition do that we see PlayStation excelling in and vice versa. Of course... Uh, we also talk about not only from the manufacturer, console manufacturer side, but also the publishing side with things like EA and everybody. We talk about pretty much everything in gaming as a whole, just filtered through the lens of people who primarily use PlayStation as their main platform. Uh, of course, that's always subject to change, but so far that's been true of the show, I would say. So that's why we went with our name. But uh, what we're going to be doing today is going to be discussing not only our games of the year and our honorable mentions, but of course also the communities. Uh, so if you like what we're doing here, you can watch us in video format and see our lovely Christmas set. This is, of course, the last day for it, uh, and or the last episode of it. Uh, and you can find us on YouTube in that video format at 10 a.m. PST and 12 p.m. CST. You can find us over on podcast services like Google Play, iTunes, uh, Podbean, where you can comment on stuff. If you want to be part of our normal community stake section, which will not be happening this episode due to the nature of there being a de facto community stake of our community game of the year that we did. Uh, of course, we hope that uh, all of you that wanted to participate we're able to get your list in in time but we were having to record this a little early um so we have what we have and we're going to go with that uh with that said uh before we get into that we always start to show off a very special way uh and before we do that i want to get into this real quick uh what you can see on the table is stuff that i had to take pictures of and i forgot to clear from the table so now it's here uh these are some of our uh 12 days of christmas items which if you are already on twitter then you've been seeing us but if not hop over to twitter every day from starting on christmas uh going past it we're going to put one item up and send it out and um choose a winner essentially every day we're going to choose an, uh, put an item up choose a winner within a 24 hour period send it out to you guys once the last day hits and in that we're also going to be doing a golden ticket and with our golden ticket uh once we send our items out if you get the golden ticket in your item which will be randomly put in by one of our friends who is going to be in a, a third party who's not involved with us and an unbiased third party um and you will reach back out to us and we'll let you know what the golden ticket item is no we won't we're just going to send it to you you're not going to know till you get it Okay, there you go. Even better. You'll just know that it's coming your way. Yeah. Uh, but with that said, going to start to show off right because I have a, a, a slightly more interesting answer uh, than usual. Uh, what you been playing, Saul? One game and one game only. And I'm finally going to announce it because it's something I've been playing for the past three weeks now uh, on Nintendo Switch primarily. But that would be Slay the Spire, a wonderful card game roguelike. But that's really been it. Like, I have not... We I've can get into it in a little bit, of course. Yeah, I've, I've turned my PS4 on seldomly for the past couple weeks. Realistically, the past three weeks that I've had my PS4 on wants to show off Death, Death Stranding, and that was it. Yeah, sure. Uh, just just to give uh, people who are a little confused, because I did it. When you haven't seen Slay the Spire or you haven't seen it in depth, uh, I, Saul's accurate, his description is technically accurate, but if you want to make it make a little bit more sense to you, it's more of a roguelike game that uses a card based combat system yes more than it is a roguelike game that is a card game hey, um, that's arguable again arguable but the reason i say that is because you're not a character who's running around and using cards that are avatars you are a character who's running around and using cards that denote your actions yes and so then you, you as you climb up each spire there's three of them in the uh 
base game, I well, guess. Well, like I said, we, we, we can get in that in a second because yeah. I know that's somewhat rolling in. But the main reason I say that is I don't think very many people, me included definitely, would call like Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories a card game. It's just a RPG that uses a card-based fighting system. It's a card game. So I, mean, I would play that game. <laughs> I mean, I'd play a card game based around Kingdom Hearts, but it hasn't been done yet. <laughs> I will grab a keyblade and I'll smack you a couple times for each card I draw. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, as we get into this, uh, my title, of course, has been that I beat um, pretty much every game that I had set out. I beat the Outer Worlds shortly after we recorded, um, and I enjoyed it. Um, the way I like to describe it is it's exactly what it needed to be, so I think I mentioned that in the last episode. Uh, it's a great game. Uh, or, I don't know if I'd say good. I guess it's great in context to what it's trying to do to me, uh, but bare minimum, it's at least a good game, uh, and I think that anybody who has any passing interest in it should give it a try. Doesn't mean it's going to hit the, the iron for you necessarily, but I have a good feeling it would, and uh, that doubles for you, so I really think you'll enjoy it once you get around to it. Uh, if you end up picking up a 1X like we were discussing, you can play it on Games Pass. Bang, bang. Yeah, because I have it on PC bang. Games Pass, but I've also not really been in my game room a lot lately. Yeah, so... Anyway, get you, it, actually, I lied. I did have another game that I played. I reinstalled Kotor One on PC uh, that I just got done playing a couple weeks ago, and I tried to do controller mod, and that did not work out well. So, so you want to get the console version? I want to get the console. It's version. It's like Fable. Trying to play the original Fable on PC is god awful, but thankfully, mm-hmm. Fable Anniversary brought over controls, like it, co- a controller input. Well, I was gonna say, is Fable Anniversary on Games Pass on yes, the co- Xbox uh, One? I don't know if it's on. Yeah, it is on Games Pass. Oh, dude. Yes. Um, so there you go. And the One X, of course, gives I might it as well benefits. Buy a three sixty. <laughs> if I buy one X, that's all I'm playing is backwards compatible stuff. Well, I mean, do what you want to do. Uh, anyway, going into that, uh, the other game that I d- decided to start playing that caps off all the Black Friday games I bought besides one uh, is I started up playing um, Need for Speed Heat finally. Uh, and of course, the last game that I won't have time to start this year, but I already knew that when buying it, I just bought it because it was cheap enough and physical, uh, is Yakuza Zero. Uh, so Saul just killed his laptop, guys. Now we have two laptops down. Please, please support the show. Well, my battery's running dead, but not that dead. <laughs> I have the charger if you need it. It's right there. You can see it. I see it, yeah. But I don't think uh, we need it. Yeah, I don't uh, anyway. Well, I can't participate in naming off things for... Oh, I don't know. I don't know how to do it. Just keep yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, anyway, Need for Speed Heat uh, started that, and uh, it's good. It, it does feel like the culmination of the three games they've had this generation so far in the best way I could possibly say Does that. it make you feel like a race car it driver? It makes you feel like a, a race car driver during the daytime and a street racer during the nighttime. Now, uh, Batman references aside. What are you doing? Playing delivery driver during the day? Uh, no. Uh, so what happens is it's a pretty basic setup and I actually kind of enjoy it because for people that like both, it's not strictly one way or the other realistically anyway but like my dad was a big fan of the old and i don't know if you ever would know this because it was a last gen series that they were t- it was like an offshoot series when they were doing a need for speed game every year <clears throat> there was a need for speed sub series that was called need for speed shift uh, and it had a lot of the things that you'd expect from need for speed but all of the racing was set up as if a little bit more oriented still having some of the arcade things but a little bit more oriented toward um some simulation like aspects being on an actual racetrack and you're in an event where these things are going through uh so this is going back more further back in the need for speed history before they started getting into the street racing thing uh where they really got heavy into it with underground uh but of course uh, the way it sets things up is that when you race at nighttime, uh, you're just racing throughout the city and cops are around and can interfere in your races and whatnot uh, because they're not sanctioned by the city. Uh, so when you race at night, all the races that you do, except for story-driven ones, give you rep and not bank. You don't get money from them. You get rep and you level up your rep that way. Rep is tied into your parts system, your parts upgrade, where it's just like it's always been, where you just buy what part you want. You just have to have enough rep for the part store to want to sell it to you, which That's is stupid. not it, it, from a game If I go to AutoZone and they say you can't get your oil changed here we don't have, you don't have enough rep I'm well that's snap. not really the same thing you're talking about oil changes versus a supercharger for a 460 v8 you know what i mean it's not really the same thing and it there's a lore reason it ties in i appreciate the, the gameplay loop because what happens is you play at night time you build rep uh then you unlock new parts then to buy those parts you go to daytime and you race in daytime sanctioned events where the cops don't mess with you and again this plays into the story uh which is an interesting choice but also from a gameplay perspective it does offer you ability to play and get to grips with the game without having to worry about cop chases yet you know what i mean uh even though you get introduced to both of them pretty early on you know what i mean um anyway 
when you go through that, you can buy uh, once you get money and you bank stuff up. Uh, there's a bunch of different mechanics that come into play, like the ability to build your heat overnight, not only by winning more and more rep, but also doing things that are like uh, challenges, like breaking a through a, a speed trap and breaking the speed that you need to. Uh, and it racks up your heat. And eventually you get heat-based events, which are you have to have a minimum heat rating for the night to go into. You have to have a certain amount of money to go into, but if you win, you get special parts, you get uh, extra money, extra rent. This is just a lot of hoops for a street race game. Why can't I just street race and earn money to buy things and then go street race with them again? Like that's I mean you you are. Even when you're yeah, even when you're street racing during the day, it's just a breakup of, of the things. If you like the aspect where you want to go through and not have to worry about the cops chase you can do that, but the cop chases are also uh, better in this one than they were in the last two. Can um, I play Need for Speed Underground two on the Xbox One X? I don't think so, but I don't know that for sure, so don't answer that. <laughs> I mean, don't don't quote me on it. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm enjoying the game for what it is, um, and it's you know nothing crazy in the story department yet. Uh, I didn't expect it. None of them are. There's just a good enough narrative to pull around while you're doing some of the things that you're doing. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I like about the game. It's a little bit more fun uh, in the sense of tuning your cars up the way that you want to tune them. Uh, and of course, the ability, making the game feel a little bit more skill-based when you're going around and handling drifts. Uh, the last two games have been that you kind of just have to take corners sideways and no matter what car you're in, you kind of just end up with the speed sliding around. This one's got a little bit more of a mechanical backing where you have to be on the gas. When you hit a corner, if you're in a real-world drive car, uh, you can and let off the gas and hit it again to start your slide and then your steering determines your speed which is a little closer to what real drifting is trying it is so it feels more skill based and a little bit more closer to real life like when you're mimicking your actions uh, but if you're in a front wheel drive car it doesn't act the exact same which is good because it actually feels like they've took the time to make sure every car controls differently and you can clearly feel that uh, you end up having to do it a little bit differently because your power is not coming from your real wheels so you end up using your handbrake more to start your turn it's it's interesting. Um, I, I enjoy it, but I mean, you know, it's everybody has their own thing. Uh, to me, you know, a lot of people really like Forza Horizon, and as much as I'll enjoy Forza Horizon, there's just something about it. They never quite feel as good to me as Need for Speed from a general gameplay standpoint, from the way that it makes you feel just when you're playing and whipping around traffic. I don't know if it's an aesthetic thing that sells it on Need for Speed or if it's just like a, a, a haptic thing in your hand like you feel, uh, but there's something about those games that always feel like I'm more in control and my moves are more me and that they feel right to what's going on. Um, I really enjoy that everything's broken up in this right kind of racing game whereas in forza horizon the same car is definitely in the opening you're kind of just rolling through and suddenly you're in dirt and suddenly you're in all these things I, it just feels like the cars aren't as broken up and i don't like the way the open world is up as much it's still a fun game but it's for as much as i enjoyed forza horizon 4 uh i'm enjoying this much more and that's been true of every need for speed game that i've played in playing the random one-off uh forza games that i've played hmm. so yeah it's interesting to say the least i guess uh but on the other hand, I uh, decided to start up two things on other systems. So today, uh, I decided to start up Octopath Traveler and restart it because I'd started it months ago uh, and couldn't remember what I was doing. So I decided to restart it, and I'm playing that, and I'm enjoying it more this time. Uh, I don't That's know game. why, but um, I'm enjoying it more, and uh, I like a lot of the I, – I love the look aspect of it anyway. Yeah. Of course. It's, um, a, it's a cool game. Just the overall story is not the best, but I think – that was never the point. I think it was always supposed to be the individual character stories. Yeah, I could see that instead of necessarily how they tie together. It would have been cooler if it was better, like the the overall story was. But I still, I get, I get the idea of the game. Yeah, well, and and I, I can, think I can forgive it. For regardless that part, of story, bit. even if you just want to go on what it tries to do mechanically, it does the idea of introducing new stuff alongside old things that a lot of people would really like. Um, so. Uh, so far, I'm, I'm, I don't want to speak too much on it because I'm not that far, about an hour and a half into it. Uh, I'm enjoying that, and I have restarted since I've got the One X. Uh, I've decided to try to play original Red Dead Redemption again since I can play it in 4K uh, with a slightly more stable frame rate since the last-gen versions actually had really bad frame rates. And I don't remember tearing. that. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, it would drop into low 20s often. Uh, it was something I remembered from not only the 360 version but the PS3 version. Stuff you look past when you're younger and you don't, yeah, really, of course. You don't really know. So seeing it on One X in, in, in native 4K, uh, it's not a patch. It's pretty cool how it does that, but it looks really sharp uh, to the point where Saul, he wasn't just super paying attention, to be fair, but he thought I was playing Red Dead 2. Yeah, and I wasn't really paying attention to everything. I was kind of looking at the Xbox and everything in his room, and then then text popped up on the screen. I'm like, this is Red Dead 1. Yeah. I just so, thought this was, well, no, I'll, I'll kind of spoil it. Never mind. I was going <laughs> to say something about Red Dead 2, but nope. I got you. But anyway. 
uh, started those up, so that's where we are right now. Um, let's see. Uh, is there any kind of cleanup we have to have since we don't have a community stake uh, besides the no. community section? Essentially, what we asked you guys to ask us through uh, email and on Twitter and on Discord is that we want you guys to take a rating system, basically 1 through 10, 10 being your favorite, and going down the list to number one, which is your least favorite, which is kind of weird in retrospect now that I look back on it because it's the same as 1 through 10, 1 being your favorite. Essentially. The exact opposite. Yeah. yeah. So 10 being your favorite, 9 being your second favorite, so on and so forth. And we compiled a list of that for you guys. Actually, Brett did. Um, and we can go through that first, and then we can hit them with our runner-ups of the year, and then hit them up with our game of the year. I think that's fun. Yeah, okay. that's a good way to do it. So to start off the community section of this, uh, of course, as Saul just described, uh, it was interesting to see not only which games are going to come out on top, uh, since the point system was going to let certain games, even though they weren't necessarily higher up on some people's list, but they were listed on more lists, some games swung up. Actually, let's do our game of the year first and then our runner-up. Because if we do our runner-up first, people can predict what our game of the year is, potentially. I don't care. Okay. Either way, I I, keep I'll let you... You'll be the first person, and I'll just let you run with what your gut gotcha. tells you. Uh, so, across this, 33 games were mentioned. So that means, as a total of every game that was sent in, 33 games were mentioned uh, and got some form of points because of that. Because if it was on your list, it got at least one point, um, depending on where it was at. So... The results are quite surprising because of there were so many games and, the, and so many people were spread out across from them. There's a lot of games that are, there's only a few games actually that got less than five points, mm-hmm. uh, which is really interesting. There was a lot of games that were stuck in this middle section uh, and we got a lot of these last minute. So thank you everyone who decided to, to send them in uh, whenever we reprompted uh, makes this a lot more fun. So uh, since you haven't seen them, I want to see, caught, I caught a glimpse of them. Like you, I saw what they were. You do know what they are? Yeah, I know what the game of the year and the runner-up and honorable is. Okay. Uh, either way, so the number one coming in... Actually, I'm going to do it reverse just to have fun. Uh, so the honorable mention, which I'm going to call third place, uh, is Death Stranding, which is a little surprising. And that got 27 votes uh, across all the, the things when it pulled together. Um, 27 points, I should say. Uh, the runner-up following beside that is Sekiro, which got 32 points cumulatively. And the top one, which I'm a little, I'm not really surprised from talking to people throughout the year, definitely in this last month, Resident Evil 2 Remake had 51 points cumulative total. Uh, There was a couple of interesting runner-ups and past that. Uh, Kingdom Hearts 3 got 18 cumulative points, which is just interesting because it showed up on enough, it showed up on enough list to get up here even though on every list it showed up on it was rather low did that game come out this year yes it did wow january i'm fairly positive um so one thing to keep in mind and another one that got up high in a somewhat unexpected sense was untitled goose game i could see that that's a great game with uh with 14 votes and that one was just more of a surprise to me or 14 points total call of duty modern warfare did get 13 points total and Devil May Cry 5 got 18, uh, which was kind of surprising, too, because I heard a lot of... Beginning of the year, I heard a lot of talk around it. And it's then when good, I finally got to play it, I was like, it's a, it's a fine game. It's, it's a, a good game. It's a game. really good Devil May Cry game. But I'm also really glad I only paid $20 for it. I, I don't regret paying 60 Like, I, I would have paid 40 It's up there with good I, Devil May Cry games. If I paid games. 40 I would have been completely, perfectly fine. Yeah, I'm fine with 60 um, though. And, I mean, realistically, if I cared that much, at 60 I wouldn't have been upset. Just, you know... I somehow look at the value of games and go, okay, this feels like I enjoyed this enough to warrant the amount that I put onto it. So anyway, thank you guys for that. I had a fun time doing this. Oh, and one other shout out that I thought was interesting. Control got very little points, despite being talked about by a lot of people right when it came out. And then again, from a lot of people that I've seen in the sense of looking and thinking, okay, Control... It's like Control got talked about a lot, then didn't. And then towards the end of the year, it got talked about a lot again in the sense of people going, I feel like it's going to get shafted for game of the year. And then it got a little points on ours again. Uh, thought that was an interesting roll around. Uh, I heard a lot of good stuff about Resident Evil 2. And um, I guess, you know, I, I don't want to go too crazy with it. We have, you know, I, I kind of just want this to be an open talk about games that we see on stuff like this. So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you have any problem with just starting to talk about Resident Evil 2? I mean, it was, a, it was a really, really good game. I still want to go back and finish it. It was one of the most impressive games I played this year. So, did you finish... I, I guess I'll give my side of it. Uh, I didn't play through Claire's yet um, in the game. I only played through I Leon's. didn't finish even Leon's. Okay, that's what I was yeah. trying to figure out. Um, Too much stuff started happening and coming out during that time frame. Well, I decided that I would rather 
get through all the games I bought that were specifically bought with the intention of trying to get a chance to play them. Um, and that's why Need for Speed Heat came last. Yeah. Because it wasn't something I was worried about in, the, in a game of the year discussion. I wasn't even remotely thinking it would be. So it became a point of, I want to get these other three games knocked out because I've heard such great good things about them. So coming into it, I wanted to spend enough time to get through at least one scenario. So I chose Leon's and went through it. Then I wanted to get to Devil May Cry 5, and I thankfully did get to it and beat it. And then I wanted to get to The Outer Worlds, and I was able to play it and do some of the side content and beat it. Uh, so it felt like I had time to do that. So uh, everything I will say about the game is filtered through one playthrough uh, of one scenario. So I want to let that be known because it's a game that's uh, sped run and replayed through a lot. That's one of the main reasons I want to replay it. Yeah. Um, I think, it, like I said about Devil May Cry 5 and going into that and looking at the differences of them, uh, it's amazing how good both games looked. And when you look at the... the um, re engine it's fantastic i mean it really is a great engine uh it just was one of those things where i think it was completely on a game design purpose where devil may cry 5 had so many loading points because it was trying to break everything up into more uh level based sections and feel like a classic devil may cry 5 or devil may cry game whereas resident evil 2 decided to pull in some of the benefits of that uh engine which Capcom clearly has ready for next gen from what it looks like. There's no doubt in my mind. But when you look at that, uh, you saw a game that not only looked beautiful, but didn't have to load at all. Yeah. So I really enjoyed that. There's a, there's a, I, I spoke recently about Resident Evil 2, but I see what a lot of people see in it. I think it's a game that understands... I, I don't even know that I want to call it horror so much as I want to call it... It just understands tense like tenseness and yeah. intensity and giving you a feeling of uh, it's one of the classic things with with mr x or whatever you want to call it, the character but of course he's introduced to you that way or at least so most people call him uh his presence and this feeling that he's not scripted and he's constantly just kind of walking around and that at any given time you can hear his presence and start to feel his presence and you kind of don't know how to respond i think that's one of the most it's one of the most effective parts of the game, if I'm being uh, being honest. I mean, there's a lot of other stuff that's great about the game, but there were times where I would hear him coming and I just decided to like weigh my options. Do I run and try and get around him? Do I risk running into him by doing that? Or when I hear him walking around, do I choose to hide behind some stuff in the room I'm currently in so that if he opens this door, I have a chance of him not seeing me? And there was one part in particular in the game where he kept walking around. I kept hearing his footsteps and I kind of just sat in one spot still for three minutes. Cause I was that kind of like, I won't say terrified, but just like, I really didn't want to have to deal with him. And I was like, okay, if I could just stay here, maybe he'll never enter this door. That didn't happen either. And he, he I kept thinking, okay, I'm getting lucky. I'm getting lucky. I'm getting lucky. And then suddenly, bam, he opened the door. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, there is a lot to be said about the game. It is beautiful. I think that it brought a, a lot of characters around in a very interesting way and set up for, the, of course, the remake of 3 that's coming. Um, that While we didn't do news for this episode, we'll go ahead and throw out Capcom has been saying they're going to make more deliberate changes in 3 uh, for a number of reasons, and that's probably for the better. I really love 3, but it needed a little bit of shoring up if it's going to try and fit a little closer into the continuum of 2, definitely with the remake treatment. Um so either way, I really enjoyed that, and I think that there's a lot to be said about uh, a game that forces you to have scarcity of ammo. We talked about that with Last of Us. There's something about that that's really fun and having to go through. And the dynamic um, difficulty for the game, where it comes in and says, okay, uh, you're doing better than we expected. We're going to give you less ammo. You're doing worse than we expected. We're going to give you a little bit more ammo naturally, and you're going to see that. Yeah. Um, I thought that was an interesting idea for a system, uh, and it definitely came in the times where I was doing better. So they stopped giving me ammo, and then I would freak out a little bit and waste ammo, and I'd be like, I really need ammo now. <laughs> so, it, But it's a good thing to remind you of, uh, of certain games where it's like, oh, you're so used to killing everything in every game yeah. nowadays, like when you're running through it. And that game made it a point to kind of give you in situations where it's like, you can't kill everything. You have to make the best move you can at this time to just survive, and pretty, whatever that pretty is. Pretty much, yeah. So uh, I really enjoyed that. Um now, you played more Sekiro than I did. So, as a runner-up, how do you feel about Sekiro? I can see it. I was really impressed by that game, but it just, at the end, um, it just, uh, unlike any, like, Soulsborne game, it kind of lost its flair for me at the at the very, very end. The last battle did not feel as special as those games did. 
So when I got stuck on it for a little bit, I kind of just didn't have any will to go back. And then when I finally did go back and start a new game, I was just kind of like, you know, throughout the game, there's only like two or three wild factors compared to the other ones. And it just, in comparison, it just failed hard in my eyes. I still like the game a lot, but it's nowhere near near game of, game of the year contender. When that thing won at, at the Game Awards, I was incredibly surprised. I was happy for Miyazaki that he finally won one. But I, I, for me, this is not the game that he should have won it for. I agree with that. Uh, and even though I didn't beat it, which I do want to say, uh, I, I played a good chunk of the game and I kept kind of trying and trying, but like, it's going to click with me. It's going to click with me. Yeah, it just never. Fully and it was clicked. never that it was bad. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. No, absolutely not. Um, but and this is one thing I'd say. Or I'm more curious about your take on before I even answer it for myself. Um, do you feel like, in in as opposed to the other from games? Do you feel like there were ever moments where in this game, part of the reason why it didn't feel as wow to you or whatever, there was none of it came down to combat for you, did it? In terms of, or this is what I should say, in, in typical From Software, I guess I'll go ahead and answer. I felt like the game at least stayed true to the fact of every time I died, I did feel like it was my fault. Yeah, yeah, no, that wasn't a problem. The combat was fluid. The the everything you could do in combat was pretty cool. The the traversal was fun. For me, I just think it lacked character. And I mean that in terms of like, there was really two, maybe three boss fights where I was like, this is a Souls game. And I'm not saying that all the Souls game has flawless boss fights, but there are there are those in the games that make it worth it. Or should you say this is a Souls game or this is a From game? It's a From game. Yeah, but still, even then, it's it's just one of those things that you get to the final boss. And you're like, I've, I've been here before. It didn't, it, it doesn't feel special now. Because you literally go through that boss fight in the beginning. Yeah. It's within the first 10 minutes of the game. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then um, I just felt like it just was not great uh, for me. Like, I, I, I could see where people are impressed by it. I can see the charm that it has. I can see where the, the, the gameplay itself makes it worth it for everybody. But for me, it just fell flat. And I think in my mind, it was that I could not distinguish a a, a defining point where I should stop comparing this to the for previous From games. And I could never hit that point. Where no matter what, just due to the nature of it, the bonfire style system, the uh, healing style system, everything in it was derivative of other uh, from games. So then when it came sure. to things like locations, I had to compare them. When it came to bosses, I had to compare them. When it came to mini bosses, I had to compare them. And then in the end, it ended up falling flat due to that comparison. So I could see that. The game was never able to escape the shadow of... Yeah, I should say that it's not the fault of the game at all, but it's the fault of me comparing them to Dark Souls, which they should rightfully be done, in my opinion. But If you're going to use such a similar Yeah, if you're going to use a similar footprint from the same developer... You also have to do something that everything. lets it escape the shadow of the yeah. game it's using. Yeah, and it, just, and it couldn't. So that's, I think that's fair. Yeah. Um, I, I I think some of it for me, and I think for a lot of people, why the game felt suddenly a lot harder, and it wasn't even, I don't know that, that the game ever felt harder to me. I, I don't, it's a, Technically, I guess it's the word you'd use. Uh, it felt, and again, like you said, because it's so similar, you want to, it invites comparisons, mm -hmm. like you mentioned. So when I was running through, I kept feeling like this game just, it feels so much like a Soulsborne game and it's not that it's not forgiving. It's that it, since it changes to such a parry-based system while using the same footprint, it always felt like it was weird that it was trying to do that. Whereas Bloodborne, while still changing a lot and making it a lot more fast, a lot more sped up, a lot higher paced, and having some parry-based elements to it, yeah. it still felt like, okay, I still understand where this is rooted and I can make the comparisons while it still feels decidedly on its own. Yes, it feel, it, Bloodborne is the perfect example of a From game that uses a similar footprint but breaks beyond the shadow of yes. Of its predecessor, and, not to necessarily better, but to stand on its own. And Sekiro couldn't really do that for me, even though it's weird because they're both the a, a good example of being totally drastic different from games. Yes, they yeah. they they both have their own unique enemy designs. Everything about them is just unique to each of these games. It's just the the base of the game is the same. It is a difficult game. It is about overcoming your your weaknesses in your combat. It is about planning out like should I go ahead and rest at this bonfire or not to revive everybody behind me that if I have to go back, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it's, it, you make all the calls you do in a soul sure. game. But for me, it's just bloodborne had charm because it had uh Lovecraftian horror. This game didn't have anything that felt like well, it was unique. 
Is it weird that you're talking about the inviting comparisons too? And and the more I actually think about it now, and I felt it, and now that I'm really thinking about it, I felt it in my gut kind of when playing it too. The game not only borrows from, like you said, when you look at it and it's copying the Souls Born, if you want to really call that, but we're really talking about Dark Souls as, as the main thing, but it really does borrow some things to a, I don't know if it's because it's because Bloodborne did them and set them up, and this is part of what separated Bloodborne from the other From games, like the idea of uh, you have, so you had the gun, and that became your primary parry base thing mm-hmm. uh, in, in Bloodborne. But when you're looking in Sekiro, it was really just melee based parries. Yeah, like a anti stamina meter. It really just felt like, oh, okay, this is just the same thing I saw in Bloodborne. It, now they're just showing it in a different way. So whereas Bloodborne, it felt like, oh, this is new. This is adding a, a real, which all the games have had parry based. But it, in Bloodborne, it decided to give it through a different thing that came down to this is a different management system I have to make sure I have yeah. ammo to pull these things off and of course you if you do everything right you get the beast claw and, and can do a super attack with your parries and stuff. well it's interesting about Bloodborne too is there was no definitive Estus class yes exactly there was just blood vials that yes. you had to buy and stockpile and yeah. where this did have a definitive Estus class it also had um Oh, what are they called? They they premiered in Dark Souls 2, but they were consumables that would um, heal you over time, slowly. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, instead of... Um, and, yeah, there were like pellets a, in, in Sekiro, but they were... Uh, I forgot what they're called now. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, though. Uh, uh, yeah, where they, yeah, again, it's not a lump sum. You hit it, you're, at, you're where you're at. It just kind of starts healing you gradually over the next minute or so. Yeah. Um, but what I was getting at is where Bloodborne followed a footprint and also introduced new things, this... What this introduced new, I think, may have been that it just didn't hit the same way. Because what it did introduce that none of the other games had was a sense of uh, dynamic verticality that could be used at a moment's notice. Whereas when you look at Dark Souls and you look at Bloodborne uh, and even Demon Souls, there is clearly verticality, but you have to do it slowly by climbing and doing all I these think things. That Whereas this been game one was like, hey, problems. whip up. Yeah, um, I think that might have been a problem. Which I thought I was going to really love. And then there was moments where I was like, this does feel cool. Like, you know, uh, early on in the game when you're going through the burning thing and uh, you can look and be like, okay, I'm going to whip up to this top so that around this corner I, I won't accidentally be surprised by seeing someone that I can go up to the top, survey the area, kind of get a feel for what's going on. But then you go up to the top and you get seen anyways. Yeah. It, it was it something, just, I don't know. It, 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 for me, it wasn't disappointing. It's just not what it, it's not what I hyped it up to be. And even then I wasn't even super exactly hyped for this game either. I, I kept my expectations in check. It's just, it was different from what I wanted it to be. I guess I should say. Uh, so it was almost a, a, it was in a prison of its own expectations. Yes. In a sense, for but you, without but. really being over hyped, at all. Yeah, not like Kingdom Hearts 3 level of anything. Yeah, that was good. But that was more like... A forgetful experience to yeah. me. Yeah, but then again, Sekiro Sadly. is that thing of coming into, oh, from doing a new IP for the yeah. first time in and a I long mean, time. I, this sounds like kind of contradictory. It's a great game. It's just, it's one of those that I didn't have the drive to finish. Well, we'll get into Kingdom Hearts 3 in a second because it's essentially a very similar, uh, besides the finishing part, uh, it's a very similar notion. But um, the one last thing that I am curious about because you got further, and I am, because I felt like it was to me... Does the game's more, I don't, I don't want to say completely narrative structure, but it does seem like the game had, in, uh, as opposed to other Bloodborne games, or Bloodborne, other Soulsborne games, or from software games in general, uh, it felt like, I want to say Soulsborne, because there are from games like um, the mechanic, or the, um, what I call the mech games, that I don't want to invite into comparison here, but regardless. Mech games? Uh, yeah. Is that they, the Enders? Uh, uh, no, uh, Armored Core. Oh, Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, so going more back towards the Soulsborne and Kingsfield style uh, type of from games, I do want to try and focus on those. Uh, when you look at those, I don't feel like any of them ever decided when we were talking about dark souls last week as our game of the decade part of what i talked about and why i loved it is the mystery like the mystery of the world that comes in and how that's in stark contrast to most games that even when games are light on narrative they tend to give you more narrative than a game like Bloodborne does immediately, like where the game purposely is pushing in your face. Which, I felt like there was a, a lot of times in Sekiro where they were trying for the first time to really push a narrative which is sad in the same footprint, so, but it didn't work. It's forgetful. Could you tell me what the story is for no, that game you played? No, not at all. No, dude, I remember there being an owl, which was like your adopted father, and <laughs> there being a kid, and then... Uh, there's a prince of that somehow matters, yeah, and I dude, don't remember I don't, why. I don't remember that story at all. Yeah. Like it was not a great story, and I will say that about the game, where where I, I still think the game is good. The story was not. So what I mean by that is the other games always had the air of mystery. From yes. you're getting such little information. Like part of what makes Bloodborne so compelling is that going through the very first section, you're like, 
what the hell is the hunt? Yes. What is going on here? Where are the werewolves? Yeah. Like, what are, what are they hunting? Am I missing something? And that's what makes the twist. Are of they Bloodborne hunting me? <laughs> even better. The same twist that kind of happens in Dark Souls 3 in a weird sense with the whole eclipse thing happening. It, it, it but, it, ha- but it's a very, very loose narrative. Yeah. Whereas Sekiro felt like it was trying to target a real narrative that they wanted to point at you and have you in the game and go, oh, I, I do completely understand what was going on. Even if it's forgettable, which yeah. I think it ultimately ended up being, and that's one of those things too, is that like I, I wish the story was better because I think they overtold it. Like the most interesting part of that entire game was the parts of the game when you don't completely know who, why the sculptor, who he is, why he is. It felt like the Bloodborne level of like, which oh, okay. to me, I don't think ever got answered. I do not recall a reasoning about him. I don't recall why he's there. Which again, normally is fine. It's kind of like when you look and go, okay. Which maybe maybe the lore does explain it, but I'm sure you, you have does. The, you have similar feelings in Bloodborne when you're looking at the doll, but because the whole thing's mysterious, the doll is just one more mystery well, of the then, thing that you don't understand. Well, then you get the piece of lore that shows that the doll was created Ex- by uh, exa- Gurman. exactly. Which comes down to whether or not you see that lore, it still feels right whether or not you ever see that lore. Yeah. Whereas something about him feels like when it the just, rest of the game is answering questions, it feels like he should be answered too. Yes. So now it's it, like, well, he's just a weird gameplay mechanic that's put into a game where he, for some reason, is undertold, but everything else in the game and, is getting And overtold. I feel like he was told in a piece of lore from an item or something, but it was once again undertold compared to the rest of the story, which it targeted, to me, the wrong interest. And I do want to say that this is clearly from somebody who did not play. I am leaning off of Saul a little bit because I know he got a lot further than I did. I, be, I, I was at the you, last boss. You, I said, you are at the end of the game. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen parts of it. So it's a game that um, I decided to look more into because I knew that gameplay should be the one thing that wants to keep me playing it because the story seemed loose in a way that I didn't, like, it wasn't gripping to me. Uh, but either way, that's enough time about that game. Um, following in to the last one, because I do think there's a couple of games that are obviously worth mentioning here. Uh, I think Death Stranding deserves a discussion and it deserved because Saul came back into it and beat it much later than I did. We never got to do the discussion later. we wanted to. Was it much later? It was in, like in in terms of episodes, it really four kinda days. was. Are you sure? Yes. I thought it was like a week and a half. But maybe, you, you maybe might like be right. Week. I, I thought it was a week and a half. Because again, when I say in the grand scheme of the show, we I, never got around to discussing it too much in the show. Um, actually, you might be right. I remember taking a break and then starting back up. Yeah. So, so yeah. how do you feel about Death Stranding? That's my game of the year. <laughs> Remember we talked about this? It is my game of the year. That's okay. This is why I, I said I'm going to have to say this. we're going to say game of the year first. It's fine. I don't care. Go ahead. So uh, now I want to hear you talk about it because I'm curious I, I, as to why. I will go ahead and answer it. It's not my game of the year. Just to So something that. that I mentioned last episode and on a game of the year episode two years ago with Nier is that for something to be special in the way a story is told, the way the gameplay is done, and the feeling that you're left with when you beat the game. And... To me, it is one of those things where I beat the game and for at least a week, every single day, I devoted time in my mind of thinking about that game, not because I wanted to, because it came to me and I was like, oh yeah, like I had that game on my mind for so long after I beat it. And it's just one of those things where at the end, when the credits rolled, like the fifth time, I was sitting there thinking like, this was a really, really, really good experience. It may have gotten a little dry on the last three hours getting there there might have been a particularly annoying scene that you had to trek through literally to get to get to the end but it was done in such a way where at the end everything made sense without you really having a deep dive into it it was one of those things that i think i may have had one or two questions that were that were meant in the game to be open-ended that were still lingering on my mind and then which is Going part of back. what makes it linger, though, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the thing, the, right? The, the, that's the mark of a of a well told story. Yes, and that's that's exactly what I'm going to compare it to is near in the fact that the gameplay itself is unique. The story itself is very unique. You think the game ends at multiple points in the end. It's very it's it's, it's a very well done. It hits you in the feels at the end. Everything comes full circle within like an hour to maybe two hours of itself. So. The end is a real roller coaster. The boss fights were really, really well done, even though they were really easy. Um, the boss fights were really, really cool. Everything about the game that I really enjoyed, except for some of the repetitive nature. The way I played it, though, was I started on the weekend of Thanksgiving, since we had Thanksgiving and Black Friday off. I started back on Thanksgiving. I played it almost all day Thanksgiving. I played it almost all day Friday, almost all day Saturday, and then I finished it on Sunday. 
And of course, a game like that is going to get repetitive. I had to take breaks uh, throughout those four days because I was just getting worn out. Um, but the game's not really meant to be played that way, but that's just how I played it. And I got a little bit of repetitiveness there. But yeah, I will mention two other games when we get on to our uh, honorable mentions that I will say that were runner ups for me and why I think they're runner ups, but why they quite didn't match Death Stranding. Death Stranding is a real interesting one because like you say, uh, I think the best way to describe it, despite it not being my game of the year, is that it's a game that is greater. Uh, okay, the, the feeling that you experience at the end of beating the game, regardless of all the stuff, Saul mentioned a part in the game, which I won't say exactly what it is, but it's frustrating. And I don't know if that frustrating was purposeful. To oh, it def you, definitely was frustrating. It, it, or purposeful. Well, and what I, and I, what I guess I should say is I don't know the exact purpose of it. Yeah, it was clearly purposeful. To allude because, to what we're talking about, you are stuck somewhere. Uh, and the and, character even is frustrated by the end. Yeah, and if you are if you play the game, I think you definitely know the part that we're talking about, yes. which I won't go further than that. Uh, but it makes me wonder. I, I do agree. It's obviously purposeful because it's something that if there was no purpose behind it, game testing would have caught it. And if there was no reason for it to be there, which I do think it... I, regardless of knowing exactly what the reason is, I feel like somehow it played part into the way I felt when I ended in a positive way somehow. And I don't quite know how to put those things it was unique. together, but I do think it comes to the point of uh, when Saul mentioned it, it's about the way that the game feels. The game ends up being greater than the sum of its parts because of how unique it chose to be in so many areas. Yes. Regardless of how you feel about the gameplay, as long as you can at least not hated enough that you can see yourself through to the story there it lingers with you in the sense that you've never felt it before and that's what got me was within the first hour to two hours of playing i was so caught up into the story that i was like i need to know what this story is and there was never really a point in time either where i was stuck in a roadblock that the game threw at me itself and i could not continue the story on in a somewhat quicker manner um it's i don't think there was a part really at all except maybe one where you have to finally where you have to go to the first mountainous area like the snowy mountainous area you have to make a really long trip up there and i'm like i this is took way too long and then you have to go back and then forth again that right there was probably like an hour and a half worth of gameplay where it, it roadblocked you from the story. Sure, and I think that that comes back to what I was talking about with the game that chooses to be so strong, and it's uh, thematically speaking, it's a game that chooses to be so strong. Which again, when we're opening, uh, we're, we're opening invitations to compare it to uh, near. When you're looking at it from that sense, I do agree with you. It, it, it's in a different sense completely, uh, but the game is so thematically strong that sometimes the game does things that would, if you look at it clearly from a gameplay perspective and a game design from like a mechanical side, it doesn't make sense as to why you'd leave it. But when you look at it and from a game that's trying to double around its themes and make you feel things in what you're doing that it can then come back around and capitalize on in its storytelling or in its, or in something and it's in, with its thematics, then I think that comes around because I know what part you're talking about. There's a lot of stuff that going that's going on around that part, and I feel like that's on purpose to give you a sense of uh, it, it's urgency. like a it's urgency, it's dread, it's kind of like what exactly is going to happen yeah, in I, this particular situation now that I'm going through it, and not just in the sense of a normal narrative tug, but more like a you start to get this feeling of like, is there more to this trip than what I'm originally well, thinking? You know what's weird is that I would call it a pacing issue in most games, however. Doesn't feel it, like it, it in this. It's one. not really a pacing issue because it's not impeded by the way the game halts you. It's not like Spider Man. Well, it's, hey, let's go upgrade my suit. No, screw that. I want a story. It's not like there's certain parts in God of War that I felt like, okay, this this is. I'm tired of seeing this puzzle again. Let me get to the story. This was like, hey. The, due to the very nature of what this game is, I have to go do this to get this done. Like it, it, it literally just took too long because of the, the vast size of the world and having to trek through it, literally. Again, so how you're feeling about the game when you get to the point, I think will very much paint the way that you're choosing to view the the prism in which you view this part. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree with it. When you come back around, uh, like Spider-Man is the perfect example. The problem with Spider-Man and why we called it a, spa a pacing issue for a long time and why we still do oh, yeah. is that the game does things where it makes you... It gives you this idea of hurry up and wait. And yeah. what I mean by that is that the game will give you this sense of urgency in a mission just to end and then give you this thing of, well, you can't immediately progress because, excuse me, because now we're going to do, 
we're going to put a barrier that we did not have to put in and just say, hey, we want you to swing around and go do this dumb thing for an unspecified point of time until we've decide that you've waited long enough to go to the next section. It's not loading or anything like that. It puts you back in the world and immediately it's just like, well, we're going to do some dumb thing to remind you that this is an open world game and that you can still go screw around. So we're going to kind of force you to screw around a little bit before we let you go do the next thing because we want you to take in. And I, if it's from an art perspective of they want they want you to take in and look at everything that they did, I understand Which it. Which is pretty much but what it did. the game's feeling yeah. because it feels like it's only introduced for that point. Whereas I think Death Stranding comes into the idea of it's constantly trying to sell you on this idea of uh, when you look at the character, the character from the beginning of the game, and this is not really spoilerish, that from the beginning of the game, you have a character who not only just in the, something he has, you know, like a, a condition that he has, he doesn't like being around other people. He doesn't like being touched. He's somebody who really doesn't strive for connections normally. And yet, ironically, the game is setting him, of all people, on the task of going and doing it. And then the resolution only further makes that crazy when you understand exactly yeah, what, why. The ramifications that, of yeah, who you um, are. Or like, what? Well, yeah, yeah. Again, I guess, yeah. Again, but yeah, they, yeah, it's a very thematically strong game, and I think that sometimes gameplay sections that, when looked at purely through the prism of a mechanical standpoint, of why they would leave something in, can be completely understood when you look at them alongside the game. I feel that way sometimes about some of the problems that I had from a complete gameplay standpoint in Red Dead Redemption Two. When you look at a game like that, and you can clearly go through and say some of these things are frustrating, and while the game offers opportunities for you to change them up to make them the least amount of frustrating for you, sometimes they're meant to. Be be frustrating because it's trying to sell you on the theme that we're choosing to employ in this part of the story or narrative and uh, i really do appreciate that about death stranding it's a game that we almost can't say too much about because of how special it is but i think to wrap up the discussion for this one in particular i think me and saul both clearly agree on is that regardless of at the end of the day of how you feel about any given section they're all so unique in the way that they choose to do it that you almost don't care as long as there's one thing and that one thing being the story is what it's meant to be as long as that one thing thing can pull you through everything else feels unique enough to be justified as to why it's there yeah and i'm me. just i'm really finally glad that we got confirmation that death training is pt so <laughs> i love it so brett what's your game of the year okay you already uh, told me this i know i'm no shock to pikachu face here no you're not gonna yeah <laughs> uh i really I, I went back and forth on this a lot uh and i think that because it's been one of those years where we discussed how everything feels like it released forever ago, it's almost in the yeah. same point of feeling like it wasn't released this year. Uh, but my game of the year is uh, A Plague Tale Innocence. And there's a lot of reasons why. Now, what's going to make this conversation a little bit different for Saul is that this is going to be more of Saul learning things about why. I, I do not want to know the things, though. So be vague. I, I, I am vague. I am yeah. going to be vague. Uh, but I think that what I can do, even in my vagueness, is sell you on why I think you should play this game. I want to play the game. You don't have to sell me. Good. Well, Go ahead and eliminate sell you further. <laughs> eliminate that from your pitch because right, right it's now, not a pitch. It, 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 this well, is everything I, I want to say is specifically about why I think this game did such a good job and why I think it deserves it. And it's from a number of different things. And I think one of the reasons that it blows out. Um, what does that death, sound? I'm not sure. Oh, my dryer. Oh, okay. Um, anyway, uh, the one thing I say is, despite the fact that, despite it beating out Death Stranding, which Death Stranding is. I don't know. As much as I loved it, I, it never quite hit game of the year thing for me. But I understand why there's a lot would of, land on. You know what I mean? For me, for the, for me, there are a, lot, a lot this year was disappointments. And then the games that I really did enjoy were games that just weren't game of the year material. And I'll get to that here in a minute. Okay, because uh, there's some other games I want to talk about outside of my game of the year too, and I think it's really important. Uh, I've said it a couple times. This was a good year for gaming. It just wasn't the year for gaming that I think a lot of people expected. Did Gate Days Gone come out this year? Yes, it did. Um, and it did get a couple of points in the uh, community game of the year. Uh, but back to Plague Tale Innocence and why I think it's so good. Uh, in terms of why it beats out Death Stranding, despite Death Stranding technically being a little bit more unique, there is some unique parts to this game, of course. Uh, I think some of it comes down to some of the charm you can only seem to get from a group of people that just actively surprise you. Like, you know when you play a double-A game and you have this thing when going into a double-A game where your expectations are a little bit lowered because of it? Yeah. Like, you know, hey, this was made on a smaller budget by a smaller team, potentially in more uh, a less experienced team. Right. Um, when you look through that prism, you kind of set your expectations a little bit lower so that by the time that you go through the game, 
it's easier for the game to feel like okay it warranted its existence and my purchase uh easily or at least not easily but in a way where by the time that you were done you feel content with your decision uh, where i think when you look at a game like plague tale comes in is they shoot for the stars in so many interesting areas. And I don't even mean from necessarily quality, though. The first thing I will talk about is the game is drop-dead gorgeous in so many sections. It's a, it's made by such a small team and in such a short period of time when you really look at it. that And not only that, all on a proprietary engine that they built from the ground up for themselves. They are rivaling in a lot of places a engine like unreal engine that a lot of people do and leverage in really cool ways they are doing this on their own with technology they built from the ground up to be specific to what they needed and that cannot be understated it's beautiful uh the texture work is fantastic if you can play this game on one of the better consoles or even on pc you can really see this game come through the engine is very surprising it's very beautiful it uses environments and one of my favorite things is I constantly talk about why I love a, a, a linear driven games. This is a game that has so much to offer and showing you why a linear game can be more, can be handled in a way where it feels like it's constantly doing something to aid in what it's trying to tell you. Is and this game on games pass? I do not know. I don't think so because okay. the game still sold very well. I don't know yeah. if they're trying to immediately do that. Um, but I don't think so. I didn't see it. Uh, I might even, cause I, I did trade it in. I went through my mind of, do I want to keep it or not? Uh, do I want to platinum it? And it's just been a crazy year. So in my trying to be more fiscally responsible, I'm trading games a screw, lot sooner than usual. Screw that. Uh, but anyway, uh, with that being said, not only is the game beautiful, and I think that across the board, the game has very surprising acting, voice acting, and motion capture. All these things coming together to really give you a performance that I think sells the experience. It puts you in a really interesting world and chooses to do something that looks at a time period that is often visited in games and giving it a twist that is often not seen in games. Uh, and when it has been seen in games on other games, this might just be a little bit of bias of things that just find their way into me really loving them. The other times that we've seen similar things uh, explored uh, in terms of one of its key notions was in a game like Dishonored, where I think uh, Dishonored is one of my favorite games ever as well. So it's Dishonored 2. And there's a lot of carryovers of things that you see in there that coming back around into this and i love that uh so very very interesting choice of how they wanted to do everything on a scope and scale uh when you look going back into you know all this coming together into the system when you look at how many rats they have moving through uh at once on the screen and doing things that don't feel like you're just seeing the exact same thing over and over again it's just varied enough that you constantly feel like you're seeing an organic thing moving I love that, but my favorite parts of the game has to really come down to purposeful game design that leverages the characters and the story that it wants to tell to try and create a cohesive synergistic feel. And the very basic setup for the game is that there's Amicia and Hugo. Amicia is the older daughter, but she's still very young. Um, and Hugo is her little brother. Situation comes up where it's just her and her brother, and they're having to go through this world that is full of these terrifying creatures that you've seen in the trailer, if you've seen anything, uh, the plague infested rats that are much more beefy and, and the choice in which they chose to show them uh, is very striking from a design perspective. But you're going through this world with, with people who are very unready for it, and that's mirrored across everywhere. It's mirrored in the way that the story chooses to play out between not only Amicia and Hugo, but other characters and how she doesn't know enough about the world and how she has to kind of go through this innocence. And that's part of why I love it. When it's called A Plague Tale Innocence, the innocence at hand here is the two people from what I view it. I'm pretty sure it's what the intention was. You're watching two people, definitely Hugo, who are very innocent in the world. They don't completely understand the ramifications of the things they're doing and they're having to do things that is really betraying that innocence um, and it's painting their their lives in a very interesting way uh, but how it doubles around in the gameplay that I really love is that you play as Amicia and when you're playing as her that same basic principle comes in a gameplay you are really if, you, technically you're aiming pretty quickly and hitting people but you're doing so with a very rudimentary thing you have a slingshot that is your weapon and you use rocks and there's a couple of variations on that to give you things. And as the game, pr pr the, as the game c proceeds, you get a couple of extra things, but at the heart of the game, you are a little girl 
in way over her head, trying to take care of her brother, and the only weapon you have is a slingshot. You have to use your mind more than you really can use your physical abilities because you don't have them. You have to leverage what you do have, which is how smart Amicia is, and the game does things to not only bolster that, but then let you kind of reinforce that with your own input. You go through, uh, and as the game continues to proceed, there's a time very early on in the game where Amicia has to kill somebody to go through and you can tell it physic like she, she gets almost physically sick in her reaction because she's like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. I, I, I had to. And it's seeing all that come through and without being up without saying too much, it's just a game that constantly drives home themes in a way that very few games do definitely in the double a tra- sphere and i've been so impressed by focus home interactive and the games that they've chosen to push through uh this is cream of the crop by far i was very impressed with vampire and how ambitious it tried to be in other sections and i was very impressed with greedfall and how it tried to be ambitious in certain sections and Still i think to play that game both of those games uh succeeded in a lot of ways but i think this clearly shows that when you give a little group of people, a little ragtag group of developers who really want to do something, the funds to do it, and not very much money, by the way, uh, that they can really put out something that's amazing and carries the charm that I think the original Nier is what pulled me so much into the original Nier when it came out. Yeah. It's a charm that pervades the entirety of the game, even when there are flaws in the game, of which I think there are very few. So Ooh. please play the game if you get a chance. It goes on sale often. Uh, if it interests you at all, try it I, I cannot imagine that you will be wholly disappointed i think at the very very minimum you will think you played a great game and i'd be very surprised to hear otherwise hmm. so okay so i guess we can quickly uh talk about our runner-ups mm-hmm. what was one of your runner-ups so this one was kind of hard in a year like this and trying to go through and look you kind of go there's so many games that come up and I have to do this from a sense of games that feel like they lingered with me and that I had a drive to continue playing for way longer than I could have. And that comes like into past completion, uh, past completion or to the point where if it's a game that lets you where I'm playing extra content okay. in lieu of finding the ending yeah, because I wanted to. So I've already mentioned one of those games and that is Greedfall. I think uh, Greedfall was a really interesting thing for me. I feel like the game got really a lot of hype uh, from a lot of people who were just sure it was going to be great. And inversely, I was on the side of thinking I've been burned by this studio before. And as cool as it looks, it's probably not going to be that good. So I was on the flip side of everyone else. Then the game comes out and And everyone else kind of were like, the game didn't quite match the hype that we had going into it. And then I instead go pick it up on just the, I'm going to give it a whim. I got it for 40 instead of 50. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to see what happens. And the game, instead of what it did for everyone else, which is turn their hype into a little bit more like it's a good game, but it's not what we were hoping for. Uh It instead for me made a game that I didn't have much expectations for flip around completely. Uh, and really give me a game that I think does a, a lot that I've been wanting. And the outer worlds shout out to it. It did a lot of that too, which is it put, Really good characters, good character writing, and great RPG aspects. Uh, role and specifically when I say RPG, I do mean role playing aspects uh, into a f- format that was fun enough to play and had combat and game mechanics that were fun enough to push you through it, while also giving you the role playing that you'd want that actually makes you glued to want to continue. Uh, Greedfall, I, I when I got to the end, I had every faction that you could have touched with, every single one of them I had done. <coughs> Um, and I could have platinum that game, but it re- it's it's a game that requires multiple playthroughs because they're the game has you do certain things can only be do once per playthrough. And I really that's unfortunate. I would have loved to platinum that game. Uh, I just couldn't. I didn't have the time to do that. Uh, so as much as I love that game, and I did, I told plenty of people to go out and play it, and everyone I got to play it said they loved it. Um, it it's a game that only falls short by being when you do a game like that. By nature, it has the same problem as everything else is. I think where Plague Tale really comes through is not only a slightly stronger thematic, you know, thematic through line, but Greedfall's thing hinged a lot on role playing and openness. And while that's great, and I think really sticks with you in a lot of ways, uh, it, it's less poignant than something that's clearly written to evoke an emotion. Yeah. Uh, whereas this is clearly written to do that, but it has to account for all these other variables. So it has to be a little more vague and give you a little bit more room for you to pers- you to choose your character how you want. Right. And the other relationships to build based off of your reactions that 
it's while it's impressive that it can do all that and still sell you on who these characters are, it does feel less poignant than another game. So really enjoyed that one. But what's what's one of your runner, runner Astral ups? Chain? Astral Chain was a fantastic game. It was. It was the story was very anime like, which is fine because that's what I went into uh, thinking it would be. The combat was really unique and one of a kind. And that says a lot because Platinum is really, really good with combat. So for them to have created a combat system that is the Legion system to rely on you and one analog stick for one character, then another for another is just amazing. And it worked really, really well with everything about the game. The lore, the controls, the combat itself, the boss battles, the abilities you could do in it. It was really, really well done. The characters were likable. The soundtrack was amazing. They had some really good gents bangers. <laughs> yes, they did. In that game. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was one that I feel like that if Death Stranding did not come out, that would probably have been my game of the year. Um, that and probably Slay the Spire. Just because I have racked up almost 40 hours in Slay the Spire and I have not had that game for longer than three weeks. Uh, that one's pretty amazing. Like I you, have, you have been gushing about Slay the Spire dude, the way that I, both of us were gushing about Dead Cells. I have gushed about this game to anyone who will lend me an ear and listen. Um, I love it so very much. The community is still very, very ongoing and strong with how many people are playing this game. And the replayability of it is very similar to Dead Cells and Enter the Gungeon, two of my favorite roguelites of all time, where it is, I'm going to play this game again. I'm going to try a different strategy. Whoops, this is a brand new strategy. <laughs> Instead, I may have lost, but hey, it, it always is just really, really cool. And what I like about it is that you can also plan just like the other games. You can go into a run thinking, you know, I'm using Defect. I'm going to run a Dark Deck instead of Lightning. Or I'm running Ironclad. I'm going to... Hit him with the, uh, what's the Shogun Yu-Gi-Oh card? The one that his uh, defense is his attack. Oh. Uh, it's something Shogun, isn't it? Not? No, it's not. I know not. what you're oh. talking about, but yeah, it flips the monster's attack and defense values. Yeah, well, no, no, I'm not talking about the spell card. I'm talking about the monster itself. It was a, oh. leg- it was a secret rare 10 oh. card. Yes, was and it, I can't recall his name either, but yes, uh, he was essentially a backwards done character. Yes, and that's uh, how you can play Iron Blade or Ironclad, where you, you beef up your defense to stop enemy attacks. But hey, there's also cards where you literally deal your defense and to damage. tribute to damage. Yeah. And yeah, that gets um, really, really powerful. One thing I was curious about with this game, and you can kind of answer it here because I do have it downloaded and I haven't had a chance to start it yet, um, is, you, you know, you talk about when you look and you say you can plan and yes, you can definitely plan on dead cells by a lot of things. You can buy total defense shotgun. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's the Yu-Gi-Oh card yeah. I was talking about. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, when you look at that, dead cells is a game that, yeah, you can buy things and you can say, okay, I want this sword to always appear in my, in my loot, uh, my potential loot thing so that you have multiple plans or no banks where as soon as you run and the RNG hits, you kind of go, this is the one I'm going to run with this time. It's a starting. And point. that's how does our, how does RNG handle that into, Part of the times when you're playing Dead Cells, you really hope for one thing, but sometimes you get given a thing, and like you said, now it has to be a new plan because you've never used this, yes. but you kind of have to that, roll with that's it. That's exactly how it is in, in, in Enter, the, or Enter the Gungeon, Slay the Spire. <laughs> so in Slay the Spire, in the, uh, I don't know how to describe it really, you unlock the game modes after beating it, and you unlock higher up levels. Uh, so, so essentially kind of like how Diablo does their difficulties. When kinda, you start to get yeah. Torment 2, 3, 4. Well, yeah, it's I, a little different than that, I'm sure, but it's the same basic idea of you have to run through it at least a full well, time. Well, that's called the Ascension System in uh, Slay the Spire. Once okay. you beat, uh, you have three spires in the very beginning. There's various zigzaggy paths, and you could select your path in the very beginning, and you can look at the entire map. You could see what the boss is at the top, and essentially you go through instances, and they range from elite enemies to normal enemies to shopkeeper to uh, question mark rooms where that you could get a relic or hey you got to take damage to uh, to leave this room or something like that you obtain a card upgrade a card remove a card from your deck you could do any of that anytime you beat an enemy uh, instance you're awarded with gold you are uh, awarded a relic if you are lucky enough or if you beat an elite enemy or you are awarded a card and you click the card and three cards pop up and you have to pick one and you have this thing of like, hey, my deck starts with 12 cards or 11 cards. I don't want to have more than, say, 18 to 20. So then you got to pick, like, do I want to get this card and then have to go to a shopkeep to pay to remove other card from my deck? 
It gets into this I do weird like that thing. Idea. It's if you are a you person, you can technically commit to something, but if you want to undo it, it's going to cost can. you more. You, yes, you and what I love is is if you are a person who likes card games and you like the fact that hey, when I, one of your favorite things about a card game is the deck building aspect of it, it really is shines in this game. Um, that one, I would say, I like as much as I liked Astral Chain, and the only reason that I will say that it is not my game of the year is almost similar to Dead Cells, where it got beat just by a smidgen last year sure just by a smidgen with god of war uh it just barely missed it so um real quick on astral chain uh uh-huh. i do agree with you on the one thing about um and actually okay before that uh one this is something that i was thinking about as soon as i finished and i was didn't want to interrupt you uh going back to plague tale real quick yeah uh what i mean by i love how they pull in the thing of making you an inexperienced girl and setting a world the one thing I think it does that I think a lot of other third person action adventure games like it is that are narrative driven do you, when you're playing a game like uncharted, which is supposed to be the thing where you go through, there's no real weight in killing people. It just like, you know, there's always that long running thing of where like Nathan Drake is technically a mass murderer because he's killed all these people throughout all these games. And it's like, he kills people without even wincing. It's kind of like, Oh, it's just part of the job. But then suddenly, yeah. it, suddenly in a cut scene, it comes time for him to kill somebody and he can't do it. This game completely subverts that by going through and making it to where she clearly doesn't want to. And nine times out of 10, you're going to have a lot better of a chance of conv- con- going in the game. And you have a strong urge to want to go in the game without killing people. You want to try and avoid people as much as possible because there is like a, a weird weight that the game puts on you for killing somebody because it feels like Amicia feels the the burden of having to know that she's taken someone's life. Right. And it's it's really interesting because sometimes you can go, well, the act of sh- shooting him with this or shooting with this slingshot uh, it, it, that doesn't kill him. Hitting his light with a slingshot doesn't kill him, but when light is the only thing that pulls the, uh, the plague rats away, fire that's in a little lantern, and you shoot that lantern out, he gets eaten by rats. So you kind of have to go through the thing of like, do I want to do that? Because that means that someone is going to die in this situation. Do I have to do it to get through this part? Uh, but anyway, going back to Astral Chain and uh, what I think about it, uh, I do agree with you. It's very unique in the way that it handled the the control thing. But what I also love about it is as much as it's unique, it's also a callback to a couple of other games that I really loved and where they try and give you control of characters through a separate analog where it's like, okay, you're going to do this, but then you're going to use this analog to do this. And I don't know if you ever played it. That might be why it's not coming up in your head. You talk about um, Overlord. Yeah, well, Overlord, Pikmin, stuff like that. Pikmin had it too a little yeah. bit. Yeah, Overlord it's, was more. Overlord was more like, hey, you still have you, and you still can do all the attacks on your own. But yeah. you also have minions that you choose which ones you do around you, and you choose which one you send, and you yeah. control them and those with are, an analog stick. And I love the idea of that great because games. exactly like you're saying in your game, you can do this, where you can also have your legion go over there doing things, or and you, you can work together. To do, you don't have to do it all at all. You can actually. Uh, I can't remember if it's upgrade. Yeah, it is upgrading your legion enough so that it just auto does stuff. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. It makes it much, it, it or you can play the whole game except for very few parts completely by yourself yeah, if you I, really want to. I wouldn't to. do any I of that either. unless you're doing like challenge runs to replay the game. The be, game actually does have some replayability in terms of that. But yeah, you'd be you'd be stealing you'd be stealing or robbing yourself of a really cool combat experience. Yes, uh, but I do love that. Um, and that's really what like wraps that present up as a little Christmas present, and it makes it as a whole is that overall experience with that game the combat yeah, after chain is fantastic it, it genuinely was uh, and it, it was one of those things where it was enough of a game to where when i bought my switch uh on an overall like a whim because i had the money to do it and i was kind of like you know what i really don't know if the light's going to work for me for a lot of reasons my daughter wants to play mario games and stuff she yeah. expressed interest in it so i'm like i'm just gonna go ahead and do it and i bought astral chain it it was just good enough that i had that point of where you're like did i technically just spend 300 dollars on the console Yes, was it, it worth? Somehow it? feels worth it. Yep, yeah, and that's and, and that's, that's what you want from a game. So yeah. I would I would honestly say that it's a highlight of this year for sure. Yes, um, I would I would go as far to say that that is a system seller mm-hmm. for me personally. If if someone came to me and said, "Hey, I can only get one game with my Switch. What do I get?" If I'm uh, if if you say one game, it's like okay. If you want a reason to buy the Switch, Astral Chain is number one. If you want a second reason to slay the Spire, is number two. Sure. Uh, like the Spires. My, my last one, and then since you kind of had three, I'm going to do my last one too uh, when it comes into it. Shout out to Death Stranding too because it did the same thing that Greedfall did where I had low expectations coming in and, it, and by the time that I was done, again, everybody else had kind of dividing opinions yeah. and all it did as I kept playing was, wow, this game's a lot better than I anticipated. Uh, but my last one is Days Gone, as oh, weird as it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. I knew you thought, I, but the reason I, I say that. I thought you were going to say Kingdom Hearts 3, which is. No, 
No, surprisingly. Better than Days Gone to me. Shout out to Kingdom Hearts 3 for one thing in particular. It's a good game. And I know that people give us crap all the time. Uh, or it's really Liam making jokes about people who liked Kingdom Hearts 3, but then they also, when people when someone says Kingdom Hearts 3, they go, eh. It's, it's not to say that Kingdom Hearts 3 isn't a good game. It's that as much as it is a good game, it's not as good as we feel like it could have been. Um, so that's about where we stand on that. It is a great game. Talked plenty about it. Uh, but my last one being Days Gone is real important, and I mentioned it a lot earlier this year, but uh, if you didn't do it then, now that the game's kind of on a, a 20 to $30 price point a lot, um, it's been upgraded and patched to where almost everything about the game from a performance standpoint has been handled to where all you're going to have now, uh, and I've suggested the game to multiple people who at first had the same reaction you did. I don't know about this game. Then they keep now going. Now that it's updated and a little bit, going. it might be better. Because don't forget, I got it kind of in launch window yeah. originally. I think yeah, it was sure. like a month, maybe. And and this is saying something from somebody who actually experienced some pretty gnarly bugs. Uh, I had very funny screenshots from a lot of them. But uh, I remember you talking about those on Twitter. But whenever we were doing that, uh, whenever Mario being one of them, my work buddy I talk about all the time, he started going through and He's playing a cool it. Dude. And he started slow and he started saying, okay, okay. I don't know exactly, but it's okay. I'm going to kind of keep trucking on. And I told him, I was like, you're going to be surprised because it's a game that is the perfect example of where some games will really nail the first two thirds and then just lose it at the end, but you still beat it. And you're like, oh, that was good enough. This game is the exact opposite of that. It's probably at its weakest in the first third, the second third, and then the final all just get consecutively better and better and better. And it's really amazing how it's, I call it the diamond in the rough game. It's one of the few examples of a game. Hey, shout out to spam calls. I don't know if it's spam call or what, but we're going to see. There's plenty of people who have my number that I don't ever say their number because I forget. Oh. But Days Gone was a good game. Uh, it was Ben doing a lot with very little, and I yeah. applaud them for that. I can always applaud them for that. And it has a fantastic story, and it really does a lot in making me care about a zombie game when I traditionally don't. So There's going to be a day where my this Slay the Spire addiction has gone, and there's I'm going to want to start a game up again. I will probably realistically start Days Gone up over uh, something like trying to complete Sekiro, Resident Evil 2 again, something like that. That uh, That's my next game on my list to really try. If they actually texted you back. Is my sister. Oh, uh, okay. But what is the community's take question? Let's wrap this up. I'm hungry. Community's take on this one is going to be a little bit weirder uh, because of that. Uh, I'm going to leave it. I, I, I actually know. I have an idea. What do you think is going to be your game of the year next year? Based oh, off based of, off of what we know right now? Yeah. Based off of the games we know that right now, what is your game of the year next year? Okay. Call it now. And uh, who knows? if this Grade is, yourself later and see how close you well, get. Well, I was going to say, if this is still a podcast. <laughs> hey, don't be <laughs> doing that. it should be. Uh, then we'll we'll actually go back and have those same people participate in their game of the year and see if they got it right. Sure, yeah. And I, I want to give a, a special shout out real quick to everybody. This is technically the end of another year for us. Now, yes. not, a, not a full year in terms of us doing this, but just a year. Uh, and Triangle Square moving into 2020. I love it. This is great. It's and been, so many of you give us your, and I've set it up across a bunch of social media, so I'm sorry if I feel like I'm just repeating myself. But for those of you who don't normally reach out to us, I still want to know, we really appreciate how much of your time and interest that you give us time is a very valuable thing uh, and you finding me interesting at all for those of you who do and saw interesting uh and, and enjoy the conversations that we have uh that this makes this so fulfilling and something that i really love to do every week to an extent to where it never bothers me i i genuinely enjoy doing this and again an extra special shout out to our patrons uh two of which this month have upped their pledge and i don't know if that's for long term or short term regardless we love you guys thank you so much i don't know if it's just because it's a season of giving or our what but we love you so much i'm gonna cash we really it. appreciate that i'm gonna cash it down by the xbox one x <laughs> bam, bam. all right guys we will see you technically next year so shut up <laughs> no we won't actually no yeah we will yeah, we, we will. will yeah we will just i'm leaving so early this week that it just feels weird to even say that but anyway tomorrow's friday uh technically what do you mean what do you mean technically technically today's my friday <laughs> Uh, no, yesterday was. You didn't go to work today. That's true as well. I did not go to work today. Oh, you didn't go to work yesterday because yesterday was Christmas. So bang, bang. look at you. Screw off. Anyway. You got that bonus check and bounce. We will see you guys later. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to our patrons, Dan Barber, Josh Jarrell, Matthew Green, my name is Dan, Douglas Blow, Sean Santarude, Eric McAllister, Matt Sycamore, Funk Turkey, Danny Villobos, Shadowist, Steven Salazar, The Stonerd, Travis Blow, Eduardo Palomino, Stefan Swanlin, Coy Live, Philip Laguerre, Corey Hickerson, Solitary Red, Brian, Donovan Williams, William Digital Spooker, Derek Porter, 
Josh Ayers, Brandon Edwards, Sean One Neo, Tyler Powers, Dylan Kirby, and San Coffin. If you would like to support the show, go to patreon.com slash Nartech. Thank you.